welcome back to the series of talks on the subject of uh, From Art to Science in Search of Reality. I'm Marcella Costa from Flinders University. At the end of the lecture of the part number four, I've spoken about the geometry of nature. And uh, I concluded overall that spice became pictorial with the Renaissance, painting became linear geometry with the Renaissance, space became geometric with Galileo Galilei, geometric space became mathematic with Descartes in the 1600s, then geometry of space extends dynamics with Newton, non-Euclidean geometry for space and time in the 1800s gave rise to the modern theory of uh, Einstein, relativity. Then I dealt with the geometry of nature, with the idea of fractal geometry for all natural structures. Today, on part five, I'll deal with geometry of dynamic processes, what has been called the topological geometry, with the nonlinear dynamics and order out of chaos and the development of graphic representation of objects in time and space, coordinates giving rise to the idea of four-dimensional objects. Well, what is topological geometry? Well, dynamic phenomena are based on repetition of processes, cyclic phenomena, can be described using what is called topological geometry that was developed by Henry Poincaré at the end of the 1800s. He used the Latin term analysis situ, analysis of where things are. Well, take a simple example of a pendulum in space. A pendulum that goes back and forth. And uh, if you plot that, now the velocity versus position, you end with a, a cycle around where you can see here the maximal velocity and then of course you got actually zero velocity at a particular point then the negative velocity when it comes back and it goes back to the maximum velocity if the pendulum in real space of course slows down because of the friction with air then this will form indeed a shape that will come to a rest in the very present time so this is are called five space portraits and allowed a graphical way to visualize the behavior of a pendulum, a dynamic system, by plotting velocity versus position. This method shows a kind of orbits and the trajectory of the system. A stable orbit are called attractors, where I indeed is oscillating in this case, stable, or become to a stable quiescence. Well, this way of, of uh, portraying, if you push this now, a pendulum, not only to go back and forth, that form this kind of a round shape of uh, oscillations, these orbits, if you increase the, the, if you like, the pendulum range by putting closer to the top, then they become actually wider oscillations. And when we come to the very top, then you can go one way or the other. This is called the the, 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 the top of it, and then of course you go only one way or the other way. If you put a real pendulum and plot the real orbits, this is how they look like. They look like a fairly stable round up to a point, but when they reach the very top, it becomes a bit more messy, and we'll see that this indeed is the irregularity of the pendulum when it's close to its uh, unstable place, unstable point. If we add now a factor, like a, a spring, uh, then the spring will go on a particular setting with a complex uh, but still stable orbit. But if we actually uh, produce a non-linear relation between the spring and the weight and, and the movement of the plate itself, then this will create a very much more irregular uh, like cycles and they become a kind of attractor which are no longer stable like they were before, become indeed 
different every single time. And these are called attractors, strange attractors. These are really orbits which show a high degree of lack of order. They are not periodic. Well, we can imagine a system which actually is uh, made of a recurrent phenomena where the value of the next step depends on the function of the value of the step before. These are indeed often called the logistic or quadratic equations of maps, whereby you can put the value uh, um, of uh, x equal y at the time plus 1 equal this relation of the x of the time before multiplied by 1 minus x of the time before. This is really uh, uh, an equation which represent, represent a parable. A parable, here is a parable, that at times is a smooth rounding maximum at about uh, um, at x equal one half. And the r is a parameter that controls really the, the shape of a hump, how high this is, and how steep is the very is the very hump itself. Then the, the nature of the physical phenomena that underlie this function determine the nature of the, the value of R that depends on the system. Taking this from uh, Wikipedia, you can see how this relation can be uh, built, assuming indeed that uh, x is equal y, take a value of x, and then you calculate what would be the value of a parable, y, then this y, you make it equal to the previous one, become equal x, and if you build eventually, you can see a sequence of values, which we'll see how it goes. Here is, you can see that you can build, and the system will come eventually, slowly, to variables until become one single point. So it will eventually become fairly stable. Now, it depends indeed on the r, on the hump, the relation between this parable and the simple linear equation of x equal y, that will show different way in which the function of uh, repeated values, the quadratic map, will continue. This is a way of portraying discrete steps of recurrent phenomena. It's called the cobweb or Wilhurst diagram. It's a visual tool used in the dynamical system field of mathematics to investigate the qualitative behavior of iterated functions such as the logistic map. Using a cobweb plot, it is possible to infer the long-term status of an initial condition under repeated application of a map. It's trajectory, in other words. Take some example. This is what I showed you before, where eventually the, 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 the map will come to a, a stop, a single oscillation will come to a single value. When r is increased, will still come to a single value, as I showed you in the slide before, but will take a little longer to come to a rest, to a stop. When r is equal to 3.2, we'll find that the selection become, is maintained, and is remained double. It's called the first bifurcation. We'll see this in the picture. If we keep going up with r, r equal 3.55, then there are four values of the oscillations that continues. If you increase, however, 3.8, become chaotic. Every time is different. It will never stop. It will always go back in, in an orbit which are different every time, forming indeed what I called, I'll show you before, the strange attractor. But if you keep going up, there are periods, even with a higher value of R, where there are multiple oscillations maintained for a while, a kind of order, and after this period of disorder, and will, if you increase a bit more, will become disordered again. So this is why it shows a, a very complex behavior produced by a very simple equation. Indeed, if you now plot the values of uh, x 
which is the value of the curve by increasing r, it goes from a single value to a doubling with an oscillation, a period of two, you can see here a period, r, until the r goes to a, a, a state where you have a period four oscillations, four periods of different values of oscillations, then goes to eight, then become indeed chaotic, completely irregular. Then there are periods where I showed you before, again of some order that occur again before, and so on forever, until four, then after that we will, will not continue. So this shows how from a single simple equation, the quadratic equation, you can have a period of stability, of dynamic stability with multiple uh, value for oscillations, until chaos, and then some order coming out of chaos. Taking band discovery that R increases, there's a bifurcation point, and then a fix, a further fixed point of cascade of bifurcations occur beyond that, the cycle failed to achieve a definitive period when R is 3.57. This is a very important number of this uh, 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 equation. This was developed by Robert May, an Australian that became the chief scientist in uh, England that published an important short paper in Nature in 1976 with a simple mathematical model with very complicated dynamics. And this really was the birth of the idea of the chaos theory. The process often named the root of the chaos, changing from uh, a tractor cycle to the strange tractors. And the bifurcation di diagram is self-similar. If you zoom in, on the above mentioned value of r uh, above 3.8, etc., and focus on one arm of the tree, the situation nearby look like a shrunk and slightly distorted version of the whole diagram. The same is true for all other non-chaotic points. So in a way, we have actually a, a, a fractal appearances of the very dynamic process of uh, chaotic systems. So this is an example of the deep and ubiquitous connection between chaos and fractals. We'll see this again when we deal with the nervous system. How can order appear in a deterministic chaotic system? Well, nonlinear dynamics, even in organic systems apart from equilibrium, can generate some order. A good example is a slow warming of a resting liquid lead to an ordered pattern of convection, with these cells called Bernard cells. Some order occur because of these convection currents. So even preparing to boil some spaghetti, you can see this order in a system which is entirely inorganic. The Earth, of course, with its gases and liquids and lots of chemicals, is an ideal dissipative system with sun energy flowing, where dynamic structure emerge, just like the Bernard cells. Then we have something extraordinary happening in the 1950s and 60s. The very belozov dabotinsky chemical reactions, where a simple mixture of ions of the metal cerium that catalyzes the oxidation of organic fuel by bromide and water produces something extraordinary. Unlike most familiar chemical reactions, this one does not reach direct equilibrium. For a while it oscillates changing from yellow to colorless and back again to yellow twice a minute. This shows this event. In a flask you can see this chemical reaction occur and oscillates back and forth. And yet this is supposed to end eventually in a steady state in a complete equilibrium like all chemical reactions do. The amount of substance they form do oscillate and form following the rules of chaos theory. Generate bifurcation, alternating periods of order with periods of disorders, just like I showed you before. So this shows that even in a simple chemical system, this happens. In a petri dish, if you show this reaction happening, they form a remarkable special temporal structures including, you can see 
uh, traveling waves, which change of uh, location. Concertic waves that start and expand. There are even some spiral waves. And therefore, this really is a system which is to be kept far from equilibrium, will go forever. This shows indeed the, the, the formation of order out of complete uh, disorder of chemical reactions. Really, this was an observation of Belousov in the 1960s, in the old uh, Russia. Under communism, they were not really uh, able to communicate with the West colleagues, and his ideas were completely not accepted. They thought it was completely rubbish. Was his colleague also from uh, Russia in the early 70s, Zabotinsky, that finally published a paper in the, in the uh, European journal Nature on indeed concentration wave propagating in two-dimensional liquid phase cell oscillating system that was accepted and with the discovery of what we call the BZ equations that describe in general anything that oscillates producing these remarkable complex pictures. Indeed, this mathematical description of the Zoltzov-Debutinsky chemical reactions involve reaction diffusion equations, which rule any system involved, constituted locally transformed by some reactions, and coupled to neighboring sites by spatial diffusion. Another good example are the forest fires, which also follow similar rules. This is a modeling of such equation. You can see, again, this uh, complex spatial temporal dynamics of a traveling wave, circumferential wave, expanding wave, and spiral waves forming uh, according to these uh, reaction diffusion equations. Now, how order come out of disorder? In general, in, in living system, in biology, process of growth and maintenance are repeated recursive and based on this nonlinear dynamics. Such processes have dynamic dis described by Carroll theory and generate, generate pattern of uh, periodic attractors and aperiodic strange attractors. This uh, mixture between order and disorder. All strange attractors have a fractal geometrical structure. I mentioned before a relation between nonlinear dynamics of chaos and the fractal geometry of nature. Driven by recursive processes, fractals are imagining images, images of the dynamic system, the picture of chaos. This is why living structures, being generated by sequential iteration of nonlinear processes, give rise to fractal structures. Well, living elements are indeed open dissipative system far from equilibrium are kept going by continuous flow of energy. In the case of cells, fuel, food enters, plus oxygen, this metabolic reaction oscillate, and they export heat and produce some work. These are called dissipative system because they take nutrients and give out waste products forming island of transient dynamic order. The dynamic order is maintained by the making of new molecular, molecular bonds, synthesis, and burning them, releasing energy, using the resulting energy to perform some work and transforming some energy irreversibly into heat. In all cells, the metabolic and genetic network generate the spontaneous oscillations produced by the Belos of Doplinsky reactions. So, in such dissipative systems, driven apart from equilibrium by an ongoing source of energy, stable dynamic states can arise. This is what life is. A stable dynamic state is maintained as long as there is a flow of energy. Such dissipative system of structures evade the degenerative effects of the second law of thermodynamics by exporting entropy of disorder as heat in its environment. In this way, the total entropy of disorder in the environment continuously rises according to the second law of thermodynamics, which is still valid. 
but they dissipate the structure maintains internal order and might even increase it. This is what living beings are. This is what the structure will maintain an internal organ, order, which can increase, like us growing and with the brain and so on, and eventually it disappears when the energy stops flowing. How can we portray dynamical phenomena in addition to the cobweb and the phase space plots that I described to you before? How do we go from what science was, tabulation, to geometrical traces? This happened at the mid-1800s. Before then, goes back to, for instance, to Newton, when he was studying the Great Comic in 1680, that was discovered by Gottfried Kirk, a German astronomer. Newton plotted the location of the time in a tabulated form, like we would do today with an Excel. This was done until, indeed, the 1800s. Science was really a tabulation. All the observations were written by hand and were written like numbers, values. Until in 1847 in Germany, Karl Ludwig invented what is called the camograph, the smoke rotating drum. There was the birth of traces, time versus space, and hence the birth of modern physiology and all sciences in general. A drum with a paper uh, with a smoke uh, um, which I used, used myself in the 1970s in Melbourne, uh, it can be removed by a little lever and this rotates and leave a trace. So it can transform some changes of length of muscle contracted into a geometrical trace. So a continuous change of some value could be plotted against time in a graphical way as a recorded trace replacing tabulations. This was really the birth of modern science. At the time, Emile de Bois Raymond, in 1847, immediately after, realized the importance. He wrote, the dependence of effect upon each condition is now presented in the form of a curve, whose exact law, to be sure, remain unknown, but whose general character one will most often be able to trace. It will almost always be possible to determine whether the function grows or diminishes with the variable investigated. In other cases, one might be able to discover a distinct point on the curve, the sense of its bending with respect to the abscissa. So his colleague at the time realized the importance. Similarly, Hemsholtz in 1860, only a few years after the smoke drum was invented, was one of the first to apply this method to record physiological events with a graphic method, a mass of contraction. So he could establish the speed of nerve impulses by seeing the difference between the contraction of a muscle stimulating the nerve at different distances. You can see here one of the first traces ever in science. Recording dynamic phenomena became a form of geometry. That's why it's part of my talk about painting and science and the, the, the importance of geometry in modern science. Similarly, soon after Alfred Borkman, also another scientist, wrote after Ludwig invented an instrument that permitted one to represent the variable forces of the heart through curve, it immediately suggested making other motive forces also visualizable and measurable. So that, that really was the birth of not only physiology, but was applied to everything in modern science. In addition, how can we portray dynamic phenomena in addition to the cobweb and space, uh, space plots? I show you from tabulation to the traces. Now I'm going to tell you something about recording phenomena in time and space, coordinated special temporal maps, adding to the traces, not a single trace, but more than one. That was the first traces that even I used to record the contraction and relaxation of a piece of muscle. You could attach a, a, a lever to the gut and see the change of diameters by creating a tracer going up and down. So this was a typical trace that Ludwig, in fact other French uh, in the 1800 did in the gut and we did for a long time. Then we thought, I thought as well, where one trace 
is not enough. I want to I want to know what happened in other places along the gut. So I had actually not one but four places of recording. And so this gave us an idea of things going up and down, and something really gave us an idea of what happening in the intestine along its length. But that was not quite enough. I imagine to now not to measure just the diameter, but to actually to take a picture of the diameter in that particular moment. And this was the silhouette of a time of the same intestine with contractions here, relaxations, along the segment. I developed with a PhD of mine, Grant Hennig, a way to measure the diameters, not just in one, two or three or four points, but all along the gut by analyzing the pictures taken with a video. So we could measure the diameters all the way without actually interfering with the gut itself with leverage. And we created indeed what we call the special temporal maps. You can see here the traces that would have been in four places along the gut. Now along the entire segment where white was contractions and black were relaxations or, or dilatations. You can see now that this tracer going up and down appear far more rich and complex and is telling us that the gut was undergoing in this, this rather chaotic but uh, highly organized movements. This represents indeed the first time that we created special temporal maps as at Flinders and two other groups in Europe at the same time developed this way of portraying phenomena in the gut. The special temporal maps of uh, movement of a content in the gut, what we call peristalsis, in vitro we can put in a guinea pig colon, a pellet, and this gets pushed down by the very nervous system within the gut, of which I am supposed to be one of the experts, and this is what we call the intestinal peristalsis. Indeed, it's very obvious, but we needed to be able to study this in ways to analyze in a quantitative way. And this is the special temporal map portraying indeed the time from top to bottom, space from left to right, oral to anal in the gut, and this uh, dark line represents the movement of the very pellet going down in time, and we can therefore measure its uh, speed, its, uh, its uh, advancement along the gut. And again, if you only take a single trace, a diameter, we can extract this from the map. We can replot this and show like an original trace in physiology. We, we take actually a picture across that created this map. We see a silhouette, a bit of anatomy. So you begin to see that I was very interested in joining uh, time and space and joining indeed physiology trace with anatomical images, images of the gut. In a way, this led me and other people to think that everything that happened that we can see as a phenomenon, as a, as a cell living or us living, will have actually a special temporal map that become as a four-dimensional object. We plot this over time, whereby we have the beginning, uh, also space, in this case a two-dimensional space, you can imagine a three-dimensional person like me, that goes in time and becomes indeed a four-dimensional object which we cannot actually portray very well, but indeed uh, shows the unification of uh, space, the anatomy of me starting, uh, and this is shown here, a cross-section in time. If you do have a cross-section in, 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 uh, uh, along the time, then we have actually a physiological growth, of course, you can measure the height of a person, and in a way, this uh, unifies the what we call anatomy and physiology or space and, and time under a single umbrella. And therefore, at the end of this, I'm happy to end by saying that we have a geometry of dynamical processes. When I started, that the space became pictorial with the Renaissance, painting became linear geometry with the Renaissance, space became geometric. Geometry with Galileo Galilei, geometry became algebra and algebra became geometry, and geometrical space became mathematic with Descartes. Geometry of space extended to dynamic with Newton. 
the non-Euclidean geometries of space in the 1800 gave rise to the Einsteinian uh, uh, modern view of the universe with the theory of relativity. And then I dealt with the fractal geometry of all natural structures. And in this uh, part, I gave you the idea of nonlinear dynamic of physics, the chaos theory, and the idea that dynamic phenomena can be portrayed in the geometry of four-dimensional objects with special temporal maps. Now, this will allow me to eventually to go back to painting, indeed, to see what happened to painting as a form of further exploration of science, in particular of how we portray the world itself and how our brain works. I'll see you next time. Cheerio.